Good morning. I hope you all are doing well. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, this is going to be a little special lecture uh, because of Veterans Day. And so this lecture officially goes from 9 until about 10.50. Do not feel like you have to stay for the whole thing. Oh, all right. If you have a class at 10 o'clock or 10.30, like a lot of you do, it's totally legit to buzz. I won't be offended, unless you're Justin. No, I'm just joking, not even for Justin, man. Any, any of you, if you need to leave for a class, it's totally cool and stuff, and I'm honored to have you here. As long as my phone keeps recording, I will record the entire experience. So later on, if you want to go back and check it out, that's totally cool. Um, Next week, uh, we're doing this because Monday again is Veterans Day. The entire campus is closed, so don't come for any of your classes on Monday. Uh, everything will be shut down. And then starting on Tuesday then, depending on when your lab section is, that's when we're going to hit the second midterm. And the second midterm is basically over problem sets four and five, which corresponds roughly to chapters three, four, and five in the textbook. And the format of the exam, very similar to the format of the first exam. The, uh, bring sure that you bring a calculator, make sure that you bring a pencil and a scantron. Uh, if you have a lab on Tuesday morning at 8, again, I highly recommend that you buy your Scantron today because the bookstore, I don't believe, opens until 8 a.m. on Tuesday. It's closed on Monday, so if you get it today, you won't have to wait in line and stuff like that. Um, when you buy a Scantron, make sure your Scantron has 100 questions total like before, so 50 questions on the front, 50 questions on the back. And if you buy it from our bookstore, any of the types in there that do that are fine. Um, when you come to the, uh, your recitation, you start taking the exam, there are three things that are really important to bring. Uh, the lab we did this week, the unknown chloride lab, bring that along so you can turn that in. Exam prep two is a worksheet. It's in the companion right after problem set five and before problem set six. And exam prep two, like exam prep one, has about five questions. Uh, each question has the answer, and your goal is just to show how you go from the question to the answer. So show your work, all right? And um, I'm happy to help on that. The exam prep, of course, will also be online. Quiz five is also due next week. Quiz five is absolutely due at the beginning of the time you're going to take your midterm. So make sure you turn that in. Uh, I do not accept late quizzes. So you have quiz five ready to go. Don't be late because, of course, this one is worth extra credit. It's kind of a cool thing to get it turned in. And we are going to do a lab afterwards. It's the calorimetry lab. There's a part where we deal with some very concentrated hydrochloric acid, and I really want you to have goggles for that part, so bring along a pair of goggles to and stuff. You'll be set. Now, the format of the exam, very similar again to the format of the first exam. Uh, 20 multiple choice questions, five possible answers per question, and only one of them's right. Uh, four short answer questions. There's also a five point extra credit question. If you have time, tackle it. If you don't, don't worry about it. And again, it'll be about two hours in length. And then if all goes well, and not God would it will, uh, a week from today, at the end of lecture, I'll be returning your midterms to you. Uh, the midterm will come with a summary sheet stapled to the back, just kind of saying, like, how are you doing in the class as of this time? And check that out. Make sure that the grades I have are the grades you actually got. If it says you're missing a lab, please get your labs to me. The lab completion bonus is a big thing. Um, Problem set six, I've been asked about a couple times. Problem set six isn't due until after Thanksgiving. So problem set six, quite a ways away. Uh, this next week, we'll do the second midterm and uh, the calorimetry lab. And then the following week will be uh, class presentations. Then there's a week where we don't do much for Thanksgiving. And then problem set six. The calorimetry lab will be due at the time of the class presentation. The labs are always like the next week, Alex. So yeah, so like you, in your case, Alex, you'll take, you'll do the calorimetry lab next Thursday, and it would be due the following Thursday at the time of the class presentation. Great question. Any questions on any of this kind of stuff? All right. 
I will be watching my email over the weekend quite a bit, all right? Uh, of course, I have some things that distract me, but I will make this a priority. So if you do have questions, don't be afraid to send me a message. If you have a problem you're working on and you're stuck, if you send me a picture of what you're doing, I can kind of see where you are and then maybe give you some hints on how to get out, stuff like that. So it's party time. Any questions? Okay, and again, anytime you need to leave today, it's totally fine. You can leave, come back and stuff, whatever. It's all good. It's a party. <laughs> Let's start the review. All right, so these are just a series of, again, eye clicker questions. If you've got your eye clicker, participate. But even if you don't, see if you can work on this on a piece of paper and figure out which one you think the answer is. And that's totally legit. So this goes back to problem step four, all right? And really, all the things we've started talking about in this section are all about balanced chemical reactions. So see if you can figure out which of these statements, if any of them, are true. And obviously, to do this, you're going to have to balance the reaction. So balance the reaction first, and then see if you can figure out which answer is correct. So when I look at a reaction like this, um, I see these different reactions. You see that it's not balanced. So for example, there's two sulfurs on the right and only one on the left. And uh, oxygens are kind of uh, well, two, like one on the left, two on the right. Um, I also, so I know that this is not balanced. We're going to have to add some numbers. And I also see that sulfur is by itself. So the last thing I would try to balance would be the sulfur, because if you put a number in front of the sulfur, it only affects the sulfur. The other ones and stuff, you change the number and it starts changing them. 
So there's different ways to do this, and it doesn't matter. But what I would start with here, two oxygens and SO2, and only one right here. So let's put a two by the water, because that at least makes the oxygens look good. However, hydrogens now are out of shape. Two, 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 four. Let's put a two in front of H2S, all right? And that makes then the hydrogens okay. And now you can see that you have two sulfurs, one sulfur, and only one sulfur here. So it's like three to one. Let's try putting that three right there, all right? And tentatively, I think this is okay, but it's always legit on these to go back and double check. And like we talked about, you can count the atoms on the left and the right. So two times two, four hydrogens. Two times one, two sulfurs. One more sulfur there, and two oxygens is what I have on the reactant side. And then in the product side, three sulfurs, so that's okay. Two times two, four hydrogens. Two times one, two oxygens. So this reaction right now is balanced for mass. Any questions? Notice that we have two moles of H2S and one mole of SO2. So we, right now we have three moles of reactant. And on the right side, we have three moles of sulfur and two moles of water, five moles of product. So three moles of reactant and five moles of product will kick out answer D. It says that the number of products and reactants are equal to each other. It's equal to it in terms of the atoms, but it's not equal in terms of reactants and products. So you can see here that two plus one, three is not equal to three plus two. So the atoms are balanced, but not necessarily reactants and products. Sometimes people like it from math backgrounds like to say that moles are not conserved. So the moles that go in can be different than the moles coming out. The atoms are conserved. That's what we're doing in this part, but not necessarily the reactants and products. So then, if you start looking at all these things, three moles of sulfur are produced per one mole of H2S, and that's not correct. The balanced equation says it's three to two, all right, so 1.5 to one. That wouldn't fly. Answer B, a mole of SO2 is, for, is consumed per mole of H2S, and again, that's not one-to-one -one either. That would be two H2Ss for every one SO2. And then C, a mole of water is produced per one mole of H2S. And it looks initially like it's two to two, but if you break that down, of course, two to two is one-to-one. -one. So answer C here is the correct answer. The ratio is one to one, even though the stoichiometry is two to two, you can break it down a little bit. Any questions on that? Butane is the ingredient of most cigarette lighters, and butane, when it lights up in your cigarette lighter, is, an, uh, is a, a combustion reaction. See if you can use the formula of butane and your knowledge of a combustion reaction to figure out which of those would be the best answer.
all these combustion reactions, you're burning something in oxygen, and the only products are CO2 and water. And like before, let's do oxygen last, because oxygen is by itself, all right? And notice that all the carbon in the organic piece ends up as CO2, and the hydrogen in the carbon piece goes to water. So I would start first by putting a four by the CO2. It has four carbons on the left, four carbons on the right. That's legit. Water comes in twos. I have 10 hydrogens. So let's try putting a five right there. <coughs> five times two, 10. That's the hydrogens on the left-hand side. And then the last thing, to think about the oxygen now. Oxygen comes from two sources. Four times two, eight, plus five times one, 13 oxygens. But pesky oxygen comes in pairs, huh? it's always two. What you'd like to do is put something like 13 halves right there, because 13 halves times two, the twos cancel out and you'd have 13. But generally, uh, like we've seen, we don't use fractions, all right? This isn't the heat of formation, the only time that it's allowed so far. So if you have something like this, if you have 13 halves, what that should tell you, multiply everything through by two. So then you'll have two C4H10s and 13 O2s and eight CO2s and 10 waters. And again, you are always welcome to do the check on it. So two times four, eight, two times 10, 20, 13 times two, 26, and on the right, 8 plus 16 plus 20 plus 10. Oh, all the numbers on the left look like they're okay on the right. So answer uh, B would be the right one here. This 13 halves thing is something that I think helps a lot. It's weird to otherwise to think about, but you just, if you can get to 13 halves, then you just multiply the whole thing through by two. And again, remember, you can always check yourself when you go back and look at it. Questions? Here's a reaction. The balanced reaction is provided here, so no balancing is necessary. Carbon tetrafluoride, or tetrachloride, excuse me, reacts with hydrogen monofluoride. It makes this species and some HCl. And in this problem, we have two moles of CCl with an excess of HF. So what this means is we have CCl4 is the limiting reactant. It's gonna be the important part here. And in this process, we ended up with 1.7 moles of this product, CCl2F2. And let's see if you can figure out which one of these combinations would be correct. The last one is a bad Star Trek reference. I'm letting you know right now that won't be it. If you know it, cool, but if you don't, don't worry about it. See if you can figure out which of those statements would be the right one.
Okay, this is the, uh, uh, the bread and butter, if you will, of how chemists make things. So this process is really important, and if you're having questions, please look over your notes, man. This is super important for uh, how you make products and stuff like that. Um, when you have reactants, all right, you have to figure out how much product is being made. And the amount of product that you can figure out is what's called the theoretical yield. Now in this problem, they give you right away that 1.7 moles of CCL2F2 is obtained. Does that sound to you as a theoretical yield or something else at this point? Yeah. Good, actual yield, well done. Yeah, actual yield. If the problem gives you a number saying that so much is done, assume that it's an, it's an actual yield, it's how much was actually collected, all right? We'll be able to calculate here in a little bit what the theoretical yield should be. But 1.7 moles is not the theoretical yield, most likely, we'll confirm that here in a second. It's more likely the actual yield of CCL2F2. So these kind of problems, if they say, you know, 47 grams of something, of some product is created, probably those are actual yields. Now, let's figure out what the theoretical yield of this thing is gonna be. It says that we have two moles of CCL4 and an excess of HF, all right? If you have an excess of HF, the HF really doesn't matter in this reaction. The CCL4 is gonna limit how much product comes out. CCL4 is the limiting reactant. That's really what it's saying right here. The excess reactant, the HF, there's more of it than you need. You don't have to worry about it. So if we have two moles of CCL4 and the stoichiometry, the ratio between CCL4 and CCL2F2 is one to one, what is the theoretical yield of CCL2F2 in moles? Two moles, well done. One mole of CCL4 will create one mole of CCL2F2. That's what the balanced reaction says. I'm using the one and the one. So if you have two moles of CCL4, you should create two moles of product, the CCL2F2. Two moles is the theoretical yield of this stuff. Now, the percent yield is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100%. And in this one, if you take 1.7, the actual yield, you divide by the two moles of CCL2F2 that you should have had, and you multiply by 100%, 85%. Now, a lot of times percent yield is done with grams, and you could absolutely convert that over too if you'd like. But on this problem, you really don't have to. Moles works just as well. 85%. If you know that HF is in excess and you only have so much CCL4, focus all your energies on the CCL4. You don't really need, for these kind of problems, the HF at all. Any questions? So here's another derivation of this kind of problem. This is one when uh, you can burn sulfur. And if you do this in the presence of fluorine, you make sulfur hexafluoride. And let's say that we want to make 2.50 moles of SF6. How many moles of sulfur and fluorine are we gonna need? And we're gonna assume that everything is balanced, we don't have an excess of anything. What kind of quantities should we expect here? See if you can figure that out.
So on a problem like this, your boss says, we need 2.50 moles of FF6. All right, cool. So you're trying to find out the amount of the reactants, the F2 and the S8. And this is all about the balanced reaction once again. If you want to turn a product into a reactant, F2 or S8, you're going to use those numbers in front of the balanced equation. So you can see here that I have eight, uh, eight moles SF6 for both of these. That's because of that eight right there. And then the question marks I have right here, you would just replace by the number in front of the particular reactant. So for F2, this would be 24. And for S8, there's like an invisible one right there. The first one I can do in my head, um, 2.50 times 24 over 8. 24 over 8 is 3. So 3 times 2.5. 7.50 be that one. I don't know 2.50 times 1 eighth, but let's hope it's A. And it does come out to be A. So again, this is all about the balanced chemical reaction. Knowing what goes in and what comes out, you can tell your boss, this is how many moles of S8 we're going to need and how many moles of F2 we're going to need. Any questions? You don't always know what the limiting reactant is. And on this one, you've got nitrogen and hydrogen combining to make ammonia. And the question is how much ammonia, how many moles of ammonia will be created? But notice here, you're given two reactant amounts. So you've got to figure out which one is going to stop first, which one is going to limit the production of NH3. See if you can figure out which one of those answers is correct. Try to get ammonia from both nitrogen and hydrogen, and the smaller one is what you want.
Okay. On a problem like this, the punchline is that if you see two reactant amounts, so in this case nitrogen and hydrogen, you see them both, you've got to have in your mind an alarm go off that says, whoa, this is probably a limiting reactant. In lecture, we talked about that silly example with the garden burgers and the buns and the cheese. And like if you looked at just the buns, you'd predict you could make more sandwiches, but you didn't have the garden burgers for them. That's kind of this kind of example, although obviously not as tasty if you like garden burgers. Of course. So in this problem, 10 moles of N2, 25 moles of H2, the goal is to see how much ammonia is being created. And the ultimate way and the best way is just to make conversions, like I started up here, going from mole of that particular reactant to the product. Now, all of these question marks, again, come straight from the balanced reaction. You're going to sick of me saying that. I know, ma'am, but it's true. So in front of the mole of NH3, put a 2 for both of them. That's the number that goes right there. The nitrogen has an invisible 1 in front of it, so you could put a 1 right there. Of course, just leave it blank. And hydrogen would be 3. Now, one interesting thing here is that if you just look at these numbers, you'd think, oh yeah, well, 25 moles is a lot more than 10 moles, so this one's probably excess, and this one's probably gonna be the one I'm gonna look at. And if you do this one, 10 times two, you're gonna get 20 moles of NH3, and that is a cool use of stoichiometry. But it's not always as simple as just looking at these numbers. Like 25 is a lot bigger than 10, so it kind of feels like N2 should be limiting. But the hydrogen has a two-thirds ratio. So three moles of hydrogen create two moles of ammonia. And when you do that, lo and behold, 16.7 moles of ammonia is all you can create from the hydrogen gas. The hydrogen is running out before the nitrogen does. Nitrogen can make up to 20 moles. Hydrogen can only make 16.7. So 16.7 tells you two things. 16.7 is the theoretical yield of ammonium. That's all you're going to make. You cannot make 20 moles. You don't have the hydrogen for it. It also tells you, like it says down there, hydrogen is the limiting reactant. And the nitrogen, conversely, would be the excess reactant. You could keep adding some more hydrogen to make up to 20 moles of NH3, but with this amount, you are stuck at 16.7. Any questions? All right, here's an example of a reaction where we have a compound with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in it. So this isn't just carbon and hydrogen, this is CH and O. And we put in 0.255 grams of sample, and we essentially burn it. And we get 0.561 grams of CO2 and 0.306 grams of water. We do a molar mass uh, analysis, and this, prob this problem, uh, the compound, 60.1 grams per mole. See if you can use this information to find which of these is the molecular formula. This is a CH and O problem. We have to do something with the 0.255 grams to figure out the oxygen. Oxygen is the tricky one.
Okay, so on a problem like this, the goal is to find the formula of a CxHyOz compound. And your compound has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in it, like all of these up here. And this process starts out similar to what we did in problem set three, when we had just carbon and hydrogen. Um, you can take the grams of CO2, turn them to moles of CO2, and a mole of CO2 has one mole of carbon. And the same kind of thing with water, grams of water to moles of water, two hydrogens per mole of water, so you can find the moles of hydrogen that way. But the tricky part here is the oxygen, because oxygen is in the original compound, it's also being used in the burning, and it makes CO2 in water. So up here on the board, I have kind of a quick and dirty kind of a, an overview of how this works. The 0.255 number is going to be important on these kind of problems. That's the amount of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And what I would recommend doing is you take that same grams of CO2, and you can see there's like three arrows, all right? Grams to moles of CO2, moles of CO2 to moles of carbon, that's one to one. But the last step then would be to take that moles of carbon and turn it into grams. So multiply by 12.01 and you'll have so many grams of C. And the same thing for water. Water grams to moles, moles of water, moles of hydrogen by multiplying by two. And then you multiply by 1.01 or so to get just the grams of H. This number is carbon plus hydrogen plus oxygen. Subtract those two from 0.255, and that'll give you the grams of oxygen in the compound only. And from there, you can turn it into moles, you can compare them all to find the empirical formula, and then finally find the molecular formula. If you did all this correctly, answer E is the right answer. And there's a lot of steps up here, but you can see grams to moles to moles of carbon, and then here's moles of carbon to grams of carbon. And then the same thing for the hydrogen. Grams of water, moles of water, two moles of H per water, this many moles of hydrogen, and then turning it into grams. And this part is what I have up here on the board. You're taking the total CH and O and subtracting the grams of C and the grams of H to get just the grams of O, which you can then turn into moles. Then the bigger moles divided by the smaller moles, uh, height oxygen will be the smallest one. You can see the empirical formula C3HAO. That has a molar mass of about 60 grams per mole, so EF and MF and this one are the same. Any questions? Yeah. Make sure you know how to do this for next week. All right, you will have a problem on this. It's uh, it's just it's a little tedious, but it's not hard. All right, remember it's grams to moles to moles to grams. So right. it's now 9:50. Normally I would stop class at this time, but we're gonna keep going. But if you do have another class and you need to buzz, awesome. I'm not giving away any secrets and stuff, so. But otherwise, we'll just continue on talking about more problems. Cool. So while people are getting situated, and that's totally cool, let's go on to the next one. One of these compounds is insoluble in water. And see if you can figure out which one it is.
up here on the board, I have what I call my quick and dirty list of ions which can help you most of the time. Like I would say 90% of the time, all right? So not 100%, but more than, uh, more than average, definitely. And uh, most of these are ones that are always soluble, always AQ. And for right now, ammonium, potassium, sodium, lithium, chlorate, nitrate, and acetate always AQ. So that means any of those with anything else, you would put AQ next to it. And if you look at this list, here's ammonium and nitrate, absolutely water soluble. Here's sodium, soluble. Potassium, soluble. Lithium, soluble. Now, let's go a little bit further before we get too crazy here. But anyway, chloride, bromide, and iodide, usually AQ, but there are three important exceptions. And we've seen some of these even in lab this week. The silver chloride was the white solid that appeared. But anyway, chloride, bromide, and iodide, usually AQ, unless you have them with lead, mercury, and silver ions. And barium sulfate is one that once in a while pops up and it's insoluble. So you can probably see then the answer C is correct. That would be the one of these which is insoluble. Usually chlorides are water soluble, but when they're with lead, mercury, silver, they're not. Um, the big negative polyatomics, usually insoluble. So hydroxide and oxalate, those kind of things. But again, most of the time this will work pretty well. Did you have a question, Steve? Yeah, do we have to memorize that? So if you're going to push me against the wall and say, what do I need for the exam? I'll say, yes, <laughs> you memorize it. However, my prof act kind of tilted a little bit here. 90% of the time, Zeke, this will cover you, man. And if it's not one of these, then chances are it's probably insoluble. All right? Okay. Just like remembering that chart from the lab. Yep. Questions. Which one of these is not an acid in water? Knowing when something is acidic and basic is something that will become important to us. What is the name of NH3, the, the, the un, informal? Ammonia. ammonia, well done. NH3 is ammonia. We're gonna run into that a lot, so please make sure you know that. NH3 is ammonia, and that's the weak base, all right? Most of the time, the acids, the H's are listed first. So D, E, and B are absolutely acids. If you have a compound with hydrogen and it's later, like CH4, those are not acidic hydrogens. Acetic acid is kind of the freak, though, because a lot of times the H is listed second. Remember, this is the acidic H+, and this is the acetate ion, which is one of the, uh, the ones that's always soluble. I hate that it's listed this way, but I'm the messenger man. I'm the homemaker, so. Any questions on that? Now, knowing this, which of these reactions best represents the balanced net ionic equation for the reaction of magnesium carbonate with uh, nitric acid. So think about what's going to happen with a carbonate and an acid, <clears throat> and then think about which one of those up there looks like a net ionic reaction. So your solubility rules will help you here. You can actually see what the states are. I guess that was kind of dumb. So, there.
That would be a cool thing, yeah. yeah. If you know those five strong assets, uh, you'll not only know that, but then you'll know the other assets are weak too. So, so there's a lot of cool things. Ray just brought up a good point about nitric acid, knowing the naming of it, and the five strong acids and three strong bases are useful because A, they're strong electrolytes, they dissociate 100%, and B, if you hear any other acids and bases, you know they're gonna be weak, weak electrolytes. So nitric acid is HNO3, that's a good one to know. Hydrochloric acid, HCl. Hydrobromic acid, HBr, hydroiodic, HI, and perchloric acid, HClO4. Those are the five strong acids. Three strong bases, sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, and potassium hydroxide. Those are the acids and bases you should really uh, focus on stuff because uh, all the other acids and bases would be weak. You said sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide. Potassium hydroxide. Yeah. It really, Catherine, comes down to the solubilities a little bit. Ammonium hydroxide is weird because of ammonia, but that's another way that you can use to figure these out. Good. So anyway, back to your regular scheduled programming. If you put answer A, pat yourself on the back because you know what's happening in this reaction. Magnesium carbonate is reacting with nitric acid. It makes magnesium nitrate, CO2, and water. What type of reaction is this from our net ionics lab? Mm -hmm. Gas forming. Gas forming, that's right, yeah, gas forming. If CO2 and water are formed, then it's a gas forming, or H2CO3. But there's one more piece here. Net ionic means removing the spectator ions, all right? Removing the parts that are just sitting around on both sides. And like we saw over here on this quick and dirty list, nitrate is always a cube, just like sodium and potassium. These are often going to be your spectators, so just FYI on that. And if you look, nitrate is in both nitric acid and magnesium nitrate, and they're both AQ. So that means if something's in two AQ species on both sides, that's going to be a spectator. So if you pull the nitrate out, the best answer here would be answer B. It's that same reaction right here. This was answer A. It's just you need to pull that nitrate out. Nitrate is a spectator. So another way to do this is all the aqueous things you can break up into positives and negatives. And nitrate is in both of those and stuff, so that's where it is. And remember too, the H2CO3, that's an unstable one. It breaks down to water and CO2. Any questions on that? Okay. Here's another question. We're looking for a net ionic reaction once again, so no spectators. And here we want a reaction between potassium hydroxide and iron 2 chloride and the products are iron 2 hydroxide and potassium chloride. So again, see if you can use your understanding of these rules and figure out which one of those is the best net ionic equation.
if you have the raw chemicals listed like there and you balance it out, these uh, quick and dirty rules will help out to figure out what the states of it are. Again, anything with potassium, automatically AQ, no exceptions to that. So KOH and KCL, definitely AQ. And chloride is usually AQ unless it's with lead, mercury, or silver. Iron is not one of those, so you would assume that FeCl2 is AQ. So the only one you don't really know is FeOH2, all right? And hydroxide is an example of one of those big negative polyatomics I was talking about. And usually those things, the carbonates and the phosphates and stuff like that, it, sulfate is an exception, but usually those guys, the hydroxides, they'll be insoluble. So if you picked answer A, you do have the correct balance to molecular reaction, all right? It shows all of the species there and stuff, which is totally cool. But what we do need to do is we need to take this down to a net ionic reaction. And the K is in aqueous parts on both sides. So K plus is definitely going to be a spectator ion. All right, you don't want to have any potassium in your system. And if you look at this carefully, chloride is also a spectator. So there's two spectators on this one, both the K plus and the Cl minus. So if you yank those out of your equation, answer C will be the net ionic reaction. This is the molecular reaction. You are making FeOH2 solid. And if you pull out the K plus and the Cl minus, net ionic reaction. Any questions? Uh, from the last problem, what is H2CO3 with the carbonic acid? Yeah, that's right. And H2CO3, Eric, is unstable. It breaks down into H2O liquid and CO2 gas. So Eric's question is very pertinent. Um, if you see H2CO3 as a product, it will break down into the gas form pieces, man. Good question. Yeah, I'm just, I don't know, I don't know if it's a silly question, but like, the two, the coefficient two on the OH, uh, you got that from balancing out the equation here. Yep, oh, that's right, okay. exactly, that's right. Hydroxide is negative one, uh, <laughs> iron two is positive two. So you need two negative ones to balance the iron. And that's why there was two KOH to make sure everything was balanced. Yeah, that's a good question. Oxidation reduction is a big part of this too. The oxidation reduction reactions uh, always look strange. If you just looked at this though uh, quickly, zinc, an element, is being turned into zinc plus two. So the fact that zinc is changing its charge, and you see this directly, this is going to be redox. All right, there's no question. So knowing that zinc is changing, that means that something else in there is changing. And see if you can figure out which of these statements is true. It won't be E, because zinc going to zinc plus two, your zinc is gonna lose some electrons. But see if you can figure out which of those up there would be the best way of stating this reaction.
The very best way to do this problem is to figure out the oxidation numbers on the vanadium. And for VO2 plus one, vanadium, hard to say, but oxygen, usually negative two, like we saw this week, and all those things together equal the charge on the ion of anything plus one. So this is negative four, push it to the other side, it becomes positive four plus one. This is a vanadium plus five. The VO plus two, all right, we don't know vanadium, oxygen's negative two, and overall it's positive two, so the negative two on the other side becomes positive two, this would be a positive four. So vanadium on the left, going to vanadium on the right, positive five to positive four, vanadium is gaining an electron. The only way it can become less positive is if it gains an electron. So you can think about this as V plus five plus an electron, E minus, gives you V plus four. So this is gaining electrons, it's being reduced. Zinc is losing electrons, it's becoming more positive. So if zinc is becoming more positive, that means it's losing electrons oxidized. So zinc here is being oxidized. The vanadium is being reduced, so we know where electrons are coming from and going to. Reduced species are oftentimes called oxidizing agents. So the very best answer here then would be C, all right? VO plus, VO2 plus is being reduced, but it's the oxidizing agent, and that's a weird thing about this stuff. I'm, I apologize on behalf of scientists everywhere. So it's the opposite if it's the agent. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, if this is going to be VO plus the first word is five, then the other. No, no, it, the, no, no, no. Let's make sure. VO plus two, you don't know what the vanadium is. You, it was five on the reactant side, but it's not necessarily five on the product side. This is what redox is all about. They're changing their charges. So you have to figure out what the new vanadium is on the other side. Like sodium is plus one on both sides almost all the time. But the vanadium here has changed to a plus four. So you have to go through this process for both vanadium compounds and figure out what this is about. Yeah, first we find positive five of vanadium. Mm -hmm. Then when we come to the product, is a positive four. Mm -hmm. So we get rid of one sign plus sign and we get four. So you should start thinking about negative charges here because it's electrons that move. So it's becoming more, uh, it's becoming more negative, all right? It's lost positive because it gained an electron. And this is where it can get kind of complicated, all right? But you lose positives by gaining electrons. That's why I keep trying to say that it's gaining electrons. So when you get electrons, you have Yeah, that's right. It's, yeah, that's right. Ah, crazy oxidation stuff. Okay, so if one side, if one, is oxidized, is there always a different one that's reduced? Yes, that's so right. It's always one positive one. So if you can figure out the zinc mm -hmm. is oxidized, you can find elimination figure out too. That's right, exactly. <laughs> that's, and Catherine's doing it the right way, absolutely. Catherine saw right away that zinc was losing electrons, being oxidized. And so answer B and D and E are all wrong, okay? <laughs> And of the oxidized parts, you have to have, you're right, something oxidized and something reduced or oxidizing agent. Yeah, so you wouldn't have these parts probably happening. Yeah, good. You're thinking very strategically. Last question. Um, I'm just curious why it's, isn't the, I don't know if the V is called V02, but it's, uh, isn't it also losing an electron? Because it goes to plus on the reaction side, two plus. Focus on the oxidation numbers, not on the positive one, positive two, all right? Your oxygens have changed, so it's just an accident that you become positive one to positive two. That's why this part up here is really important, man. 
you've got to break it down to the raw vanadium source, all right? And in the first one, vanadium was positive five, and the second one was positive four. So vanadium, uh, the oxidation number went down. It became like more negative, all right? The charge on the little species went up, but this is the part you're after, Zeke. So, so Zeke's question is very relevant. The positive one to positive two, yeah, it feels like it lost an electron, but you've got to focus on the raw oxidation numbers, the vanadium uh, changing, in this case, from positive five to positive two. It's oxygen's fault. There's two of them in the first one and only one on the second one, so it's different. Okay. All right, one more question. So in these types of equations, we usually want to indicate like um, hydrogen and oxygen creating at the same charge, so we want to focus on the elements and stuff. Yeah, totally. Unless you saw, uh, Madison, unless you saw like O2 going to oxide or hydrogen gas being created from H+, then absolutely, the oxygens and the hydrogens usually won't be the answer. But if, if you see the elemental forms, then that might be something to think about, all right? But you're right, like on this one, they're all just spectators, really. That's just oxygen. All right, we've got sodium carbonate. You put 6.73 grams into 250 milliliters total solution. There's the molar mass of sodium carbonate. What's the concentration? And remember in this world, concentration means moles per liter, big M. See if you can find out which one of those numbers is correct. So big M, it's moles per liter. And on a problem like this, you want to make sure that you end up with moles on top and liters on the bottom. So 6.73 is mass, grams. You can turn it into moles using the 106 number, 106 grams per mole. You can see the grams will cancel. This will be how you get the most part. And then the bottom, you want to divide by the liters. It starts off as 250 milliliters. How many milliliters per liter? Okay. One thousand, good, thank you. I know you're sick of that, but I want to make sure. Turn your milliliters into liters, all right? 
So if you do this, 6.73 divided by 106 divided by what's essentially 0 0.250, answer C comes out. So if you have answer C, Any questions on that? Yeah. You divide, you divide by zero. What, 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 sorry, I was just confused because I, I divide by the 0.25 and I got a weird number. So what are the units of big M? Oh, moles per liter moles over gram. Yeah, that's right. So what are the units of big M? Oh, moles per liter moles over gram. Yeah, that's right. No, 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 it's OK. It's nice. <laughs> you had a 50-50 chance, man. Yeah. It's all right. You better to make a mistake now than later on next week, right? So no problem. In addition to making solutions, which is kind of what the last one was all about, you can also do the dilution equation. This is the M1V1 equals M2V2 thing we talked about. And we've got 0.25 molar HCl and 60 milliliters of it. And for better or worse, we add a bunch of water. We end up with 500 milliliters of solution. And you want to figure out the new concentration, the M2. So again, what I would do is use M1V1 equals M2V2. See what you can do. highly recommend you just keep it in milliliters, all right? There's no reason on this problem to go to liters unless you just are bored, which is okay too, but seriously, <laughs> save yourself some time, all right? Just one less thing you have to worry about. So M1, the initial concentration, 0.25, V1 in milliliters, 60 milliliters. And then that's gonna equal M2, the new concentration, which is what you're after. And V2 is this new volume, the 500. So again, it's milliliters, milliliters, molarity, molarity. 0.25 times 60 divided by 500 is what I would do. If you do this, you should get answer C. And again, it's not wrong to go to liters, so 0 0.06 divided by 0.5, but it's just one more little obstacle, you know? So if you do it, it's okay, but I am trying to make your own. So they will tell you they have to change one is they weren't the same. Like yeah. One was liters and one was milliliters. You bet. Match them. You bet, Catherine. Okay. Make sure they're the same. All right. If you wanted to use kiloliters, you could. All right. But yeah, just make sure they're the same. Excellent. pH is something we're kind of very briefly looking at, and it is something that's kind of important. This is a nitric acid solution, all right, with a concentration of 0 0.030, and you want to find the pH of the solution. And if you see something about pH, pH equals minus log of the H plus, that's the concentration of your acid. So in this problem, the H plus is this 0 0.030 molar value. So see if you can put this in your calculator, minus log 0 0.030 is 
specific and capable examples. Outstanding. So using the base 10 log is an important part of this, and make sure you know for next week how to do it. LN is natural log, and LOG, which we're using here, is a base 10 log, and they are different kinds of functions. But if you did it right, and it looks like you guys are just rocking this, uh, 1.52 is the pH. Remember, if you have an acid, your pH will be less than 7. So if you have any kind of acid, the pH should come out to be acidic, all right, less than 7, and this definitely is. The bases, the metal hydroxides, will often have pHs larger than 7, which is basic. Any questions on that? So here's a question uh, with solution stoichiometry, all right? We've got this reaction between uh, carb uh, sodium carbonate, excuse me, and nitric acid making those other products. And we want to figure out the grams of sodium carbonate required to react with the 25 milliliters of 0.155 molar nitric acid. So what you'll need for this problem is you'll need the two moles nitric acid to one mole sodium carbonate relationship. See if you can figure out what the answer is.
Is it possible to have negative pH? <coughs> it's very rare, but it does happen sometimes. There's what they call super acids, and those pHs are less than zero. There's also some super bases with pHs larger than 14. What is that? We'll talk about that in Chem 223. In this problem, all right, the question is how many grams of this compound, sodium carbonate, do you need to neutralize or react with that many milliliters of nitric acid? And the punchline here is that the 0.155, the big M, moles per liter, all right? So you need to turn the milliliters into liters on this one. You can't get by with just milliliters on this one, unfortunately. So divide 25 by 1,000 to get the liters and multiply it by 0.155. That'll give you the moles of the nitric acid. And the equation says that two moles of nitric acid are needed for every one mole of sodium carbonate. So you're kind of turning the moles of nitric acid that you have into moles of sodium carbonate that you need. And if the molar mass is 106 grams per mole, you can multiply the moles of nitric or sodium carbonate by it to get the mass. If you did this and you got 0 0.205, well done. Any questions on that? So let's change gears now a little bit and talk a little bit about heat transfer. This is a question where you can calculate the specific heat of a compound, in this case, copper. And we have a piece of copper. We're heating it for two seconds and transferring 100 joules of heat energy to it. And the copper temperature goes from 20 to 71.9. See if you can find the specific heat. This is a Q equals MC delta T problem. You're changing the temperature of the substance, but you're not changing the solid to a liquid, changing the phase. So solve for the C in the Q equals MC delta T. Do we ever actually have to use the time? Next term, in kinetics, we will, but here, it doesn't do it. Yeah, good, good, good. I have such sights to show you. I saw Hellraiser the other day, so I keep quoting that. My apologies, that's really not a good example as an instructor. But, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll see that later. I don't recommend Hellraiser to watch them. The answer's up here. Answer E doesn't make sense. Um, heat capacity values are always positive numbers. So if you ever calculate a heat capacity which is negative, uh, something's wrong with the calculation, all right? So it's gonna be one of these first four answers. And up here on the board, I kinda got it set out for you. Q is 100 joules, and that equals M, five grams. We're looking for C, the specific heat, and delta T, final temperature minus initial temperature. So this copper started at 20 degrees, that's the initial temperature, and it ended up at 71.9. So your delta T would be 71.9 minus 20. So to solve for C, it's 100 divided by five, divided by uh, 51.9, I think. If you put this in your calculator, you'll get a better of an answer than I can babble about. 0.385 is the heat capacity of that. 
Um, your delta T can be Celsius or Kelvin. Usually Celsius are values that are given, but you're welcome to use Kelvin too. Any questions? Sometimes it's nice to use a, a type of an MC delta T to find the initial temperature of a sample of water. Now, in this problem, all right, you have 108 grams of water at 22.5 degrees Celsius, and it's mixed with 65.1 grams of water. But cha, we forgot to measure that temperature of that water. But we mix these two together, and the final temperature, 47.9. You can use this information to calculate the temperature of the other sample of water. But remember here that your water, 22.5, went up to 47.9. So do you think 22.5 Celsius, is that going to be the cold temperature or the hot temperature? Cold. Yeah, probably that's going to be the cold because the final temperature of the two waters together was 47.9. And remember, hot plus cold always equals warm. So in this case, you have the cold temperature, 22.5. You've got the final warm temperature, 47.9. The initial temperature of that other sample will be some number larger than 47.9. So knowing that, see if you can figure out which of those other answers it's going to be.
So on this problem, hot plus cold goes to zero. This is the first law of thermodynamics, which just means you're not creating or destroying any energy. And each of the hot and cold represents one of the water samples, an MC delta T. So when you put all the units together, you're looking for the initial temperature Ti of the hot sample. Uh, we talked about how this has to be warmer to get to a median temperature of 47.9. You wanna make sure uh, at the end you get like a positive number. Water freezes at zero and boils at 100. So it can't be less than zero or more than 100 without going through the heat times mass calculation when you do a phase change. And I would give you those kind of numbers so this isn't that kind of problem. But anyway, this last step right here, 4.184 is the heat capacity for liquid water, and it's on both sides, so you can cancel it. Uh, plug and chug, if you got 90 degrees Celsius, well done. Any questions? This is an example of a combustion reaction and it gives us an enthalpy of combustion, which is like an enthalpy of reaction. And it says that every time this reaction happens, you get a negative 2044 kilojoules out, all right? So let's say that we're gonna combust three moles of propane, C3H8. Remember, this is the energy per reaction with one mole of C3H8. See if you can figure out which of these would best represent the combustion with three moles of propane. Watch the signs of the energy. So this number right here, that's the energy for every reaction that happens. And what that means is you get this much energy out, which is exothermic, you get it out per mole of C3H8, which is what I wrote up here. But it also means you get that much energy out per five moles of O2 that have been burned. You get that much energy out for every three moles of CO2 that are made, and that much energy for every four moles of water that are made. So if you're putting three moles of propane in, you're gonna make three times that amount of energy. This is the energy per C3H8, and here we have essentially three. So you multiply it by three, negative 6,132 kilojoules. The positive number down here would be right if this was an endothermic reaction, but the combustion reaction is usually a lot of energy given out. And you can see that from the negative sign, right?
We've got time for one more, and then we'll start buzzing through the rest of the questions. Um, this is an example of taking a compound called silane, SiH4, and you're making SiO2 and water. And I've given you here some heat of formation values. See if you can find the enthalpy of this overall reaction. This is one of those add up all of the enthalpies that are products minus adding up all of the enthalpies that are the reactants. I'm not giving you one of those reactants or products up there. See if you can remember why I didn't put that one up there. Ah. <laughs> You're awesome. You're all awesome to be here in the second hour of this uh, thing. Prop FX. Also remember to multiply the water by two because of that two right there. If you did that already, cool, but if you didn't. <coughs> These kind of problems, if you have a list of delta HF, which are like the table at the end of problem set five, or if they're given to you, then it's always the delta H's of the products minus the delta H's of the reactants. So in this one, you would take the delta H of SiO2 plus two times the delta HF of water. Each of these is per mole, so you need to multiply the water by two in order to get that one. And those two minus the reactants is going to be your answer. So you'd minus 34.3. But you see I didn't give you oxygen, O2. What is the value of delta HF for all elements in their standard states? Zero. That's right. So a lot of times on these problems, hint, hint, if you're looking for O2 and it's not listed, don't panic. That probably means that's going to be a reactant, an element in its standard state, and your value will be zero. So products minus reactants, SiO2 plus two times water minus 34.3, answer B. All right, if you got answer A, I think you had it right. It just you didn't do the two times water. Pretty, totally legit. And again, oxygen is zero, like all elements in their standard states. That would be H2 gas, that would be sodium metal, mercury liquid, et cetera, et cetera. 
All right, I'm gonna buzz through uh, our last two questions here fast because uh, we're running out of time. This is a question about heat of formation, all right? And heat of formation for methanol. And heat of formation means two things. It means one mole of product, and all of these four have one mole. But the other thing is it means all reactants are elements in their standard states. And elements are not compounds. So CH4 is out, CO, again a mixture of C and O, out, water is out. So this one is looking good, one mole of, re of product, reactants, graphite, hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, B is going to be the heat of formation. And again, the punchline, one mole of product and all reactants are elements, no compounds, H2O, CO, and CH4, mixtures of elements, those would be compounds. And then finally, this is a Hess's Law problem where you want to find the standard molar enthalpy of FeCl2. And on this one, you kind of need to use your understanding of heat of formations to write a heat of formation reaction. One mole of FeCl2 reactants, elements in their standard states would be iron plus Cl2. And then if you use Hess's law, um, you'll leave the second equation as is. You want iron as a reactant, but the other one, you want to flip the FeCl2. You want FeCl2 to be a product, and right now FeCl2 is a reactant. So the negative 57.7 became a positive number. Add those two together, negative 341.8 kilojoules. Any questions? One. Yes. Are you, if they give you the equation, like in this one, they didn't distribute the two key deformations, but if they give you the original equation, can you alter that to try and match what you're looking for? Uh, like, say you have more maps in the original equation, you can try it and multiply it, or are you trying to make these two match that? I would highly recommend the latter, all right? Have these two match the given equation. Zeke, if you're really clever, you can do stuff like that, but it's easy to get mixed up too. So as your instructor, I would recommend that you like make it look like the desired equation. But Zeke, you can do it, just be very, very careful. All right, yeah. They should always cancel with Hess's law. So if you don't, just look back at what you're adding and subtracting. Yeah, that's right. I, I won't give you ones, I promise, that don't cancel. <laughs> All right. This is my word of honor as your instructor. All right. Yes. Can I look at the other, the previous question? Uh, not right now, because I have a meeting at 11 o'clock I need to go to. But these are online, too, if you look at the PowerPoint notes. All right. Have a wonderful weekend. I will see you on Tuesday or next week. Thank you so much for sticking with me.